it is a dangerous thing to let the government tell you who you are and define who you are because the government gives and the government takes away. The Armenians had to go to court to legally become white. If you can be awarded this category legally, and then it can be challenged by the government, and then it's re-awarded to you, what does that say about the category? It tells me that the category is absolute nonsense, and, and this term white is being used as a stand-in for something else that really doesn't make a lot of sense in reality. They had to prove that they were undeniably white, or they would be denied citizenship. So what happened with Tato's Cartosian? Why was the United States bringing a lawsuit against him to annul his citizenship based on his race? Hi, I'm Danielle Romero, and thank you so much for joining me again today on my channel, where I've been working on this series called Becoming American, and it's been kind of delving into this really fascinating and strange history of how people started becoming white here in America. Now, if you've been on my channel for any amount of time, you know that I really don't agree with the terminology white. I think it's kind of silly and non-descriptive, but it's not just a silly phrase that has been applied to various groups over time. It actually was a legal standing in the United States. And for the Armenians, they had a very different ex experience than other immigrants that came over. You know, what we're talking about, we've talked about the Italian experience of becoming white and the Irish experience of becoming white. Those weren't legal processes. Those are more of these latent, slow assimilations into greater American culture. But not so for the Armenians. The Armenians had to go to court to legally become white. Now, in the captivating story of Tatos Cartosian, a renowned rug dealer from Portland, Oregon, we can find a microcosm of the larger narrative about how Armenians became white in America. Now, Portland, Oregon is probably not the first place that comes to mind when you think about the civil rights movement or racial equality. But in this then unassuming town, a landmark case unfolded in 1925. The United States versus Tedos Cartosian. That's right. The United States was bringing the suit against this Armenian immigrant. And it shed light on the intricate complexity of Armenian American identity and their delicate association with whiteness. Now, Tedos Cartosian was a Christian man who had emigrated from Armenia and he sought U.S. citizenship in Portland in 1923. Judge Robert Bean provisionally had granted him citizenship, recognizing his whiteness, but reserving the right to initiate cancellation proceedings if necessary because Cartosian had what was noted as, quote, a trifle olive complexioned skin, unquote. However, the Cartosian family soon found themselves at the mercy of a relentless naturalization examiner. Now, even just this phrase like strikes fear into my heart, um, to have someone like really examining you up close. And it's just interesting, the idea of the, the olive complexion skin, because at least for me, I look different depending on what season it is and how much sunscreen I wear. I literally have different makeup for winter than I do for summer because I change that much in color when I'm in the sun. And so when I, if I was, if I was thinking about, okay, like my citizenship is based on the color that I'm presenting, like you better believe I would have been staying completely out of the sun, but we'll pick it back up on that later. Tomlinson contended that Armenians were closely akin to non-white groups, which kind of blurred the distinction between them and, quote, white persons. The Attorney General's office initiated the United States versus Cartosian, seeking to annul his citizenship based on racial ineligibility. Now, when we're talking about this, we're actually talking in a, we're using a legal framework to determine white. Remember we talked about in 1790, the founding fathers had used the phrase that free white persons, that specific phrase, that they were eligible to become naturalized U.S. citizens. So now there's this battle over who counts inside of that framework. Who do we want to let in? 
Now, similar cases were happening around the country at this time because the Armenians were fleeing their homeland, which we'll get to in a second. So similar cases are happening, but they were suspended and everybody was watching Portland, Oregon to see what would happen. Nobody was sure which way the pendulum would swing. Would Armenians count as white and be allowed to naturalize as citizens? Or was that option off the table? The whole country was waiting and watching. Now, to truly grasp the significance of Tedos Kartosian story and many, Ar many other Armenian immigrants at this time, we have to understand the context in which it unfolded. In the wake of the Armenian genocide of 1915 and the surrounding years, we saw the obliteration of over one and a half million Armenians and a dispersion of survivors across continents. And the Armenian community was in a precarious position. Now, they had once held aspirations for their own homeland, but in 1924, their primary concern had shifted to mere survival. The establishment of the Armenian Republic in 1918 proved short-lived as it succumbed to defeat in a war with Turkey and was subsequently absorbed into the Soviet Union. In the United States, however, Armenians had managed to establish a firmer foothold, building businesses, gaining access to elite educational institutions, and pursuing white-collar professions. These, these immigrants were contributing so much to our country right off the bat. They were here and they were in it. It was in this context that the question of whiteness became paramount for the Armenian American community. If they didn't, if they weren't able to naturalize as citizens and call America home, where would they call home? But this journey actually begins even a bit earlier than the Cartosians. In 1909, there was a significant court case that took place in Boston. And there were four Ottoman-born Armenian men, and I'm going to totally butcher their names, so I'm going to try. Jacob Halagian, a man named Ekmagian, Avak Moradian, and Basar Bayans. I think that's how you say their names. They sought citizenship, and they succeeded in their petition against government opposition. So this was actually before Cartosian, so they were trying to get citizenship. And the news of their legal triumph appeared as a small headline on the congested third page the following morning, stating, quote, citizenship for Armenians. While this article may have gone unnoticed by many readers at the time, the implications of this case were momentous. A few months later, Congress actually reinforced Lowell's decision by exempting Armenians, along with Assyrians and Jews, from the prevailing rule that Asiatics were ineligible for naturalization. That is to say that um, a few years earlier before Cartosian's case, they had already gone through this process and said, you know what, they're not going to count as Asian. We're going to say uh, the Jews and the uh, Assyrians and the Armenians, they count as white. We're putting them over here. And the founding fathers didn't tell us how to interpret that phrase, but that was the phrase that we were left with. Now, the malleability and instability of racial categories allowed Armenians to take advantage of these blurry boundaries of whiteness and transition from the potential members of, quote, a yellow race to being recognized as white persons who are now eligible for naturalization and citizenship. The classification as white was far from firmly established. Even in the 1909 case, the argument presented in court emphasized the role of popular knowledge in determining racial categories. So, like I said, the, the idea of white, uh, a white person is who can be naturalized as a citizen, you know, as far as the 1790 understanding, the idea of white is not a scientific one. They're using what they're calling popular knowledge. And so the United States contended that the average person understood what it meant to be a white person, even though there was no concrete definition. Now, the judge dismissed this argument, stating that skin color alone was an unreliable indicator of whiteness, and he further asserted that Armenians in appearance would, quote, pass undistinguished in Western Europe. The court even refuted the existence of specific racial categories, but ruled that Armenians had always been considered white persons based on this ordinary classification. So what happened with Tato's Cartosian? Why was the United States bringing a lawsuit against him to annul his citizenship based on his race? 
Well, the case of Talos Cartosian in 1923 was a crucial turning point in this ongoing struggle for Armenian Americans to secure their place within the category of whiteness. And it was an incredible production. To effectively present himself as white and win his case, Cartosian had to meticulously assemble a range of characteristics, behaviors, alliances, and appearances before the court. This was like a big spectacle. The construction of Armenian whiteness was crucial to securing the recognition for citizenship. They had to prove that they were undeniably white or they would be denied citizenship. Expert witnesses, such as an anthropologist named Franz Boas, testified in support of Armenian whiteness, while, quote, ordinary Armenians who had successfully married into white European families or embraced Protestantism were called to the stand. Now, one often overlooked aspect in this case was the role played by the American-born or American-raised children of the Cartosians. There's this iconic image of from the Cartosian trial, where Tedos is standing there with his adult daughters on either side of him, Hazel and Ori, and they testified to defend their father's application for naturalization. The defense team presented them as prime evidence of their father's whiteness and the whiteness of the entire Armenian immigrant community. However, the evidence surrounding the everyday lives of the Cartosian daughters painted a slightly different picture. Hazel, in particular, maintained really strong ties to her Armenian heritage, according to a book that I read, and she was deeply connected to her heritage in a very public way in Portland. And despite the pressure to conform during a time of assimilation, Hazel had outspokenly criticized war crimes against Armenians and tirelessly fundraised for victims of the Armenian genocide. However, in the court's eyes, Hazel and her father's racial classification remained debatable and contested. The Cartosian ruling thrust the racial identity of Armenian Americans into the spotlight, captivating public curiosity and carrying significant legal consequences. Like I said, the other stories we've been talking about, we're talking about the Poles, the Italians, the Irish, they're not going to court to bring evidence to prove that they are white enough to be American citizens. This is absolutely unprecedented um, as far as what we have covered on this channel so far. The story of the Cartosians culminated in July of 1925 when the U.S. District Court in Portland delivered its ruling. Armenians were deemed white and the government's cancellation suit was dismissed, allowing Tatos to remain an American citizen. Tatos Cartosian served as a remarkable testament to how intricate and how also weirdly vague this whole process actually was. While the ruling granted the Cartosians legal recognition as white, it didn't erase deep-seated prejudice against Armenian um, Americans or Armenian immigrants. You know, like every other group, every other you know new kid on the block that's coming to the United States, they had to work to establish their place here in America. Now, many Armenian families encourage their children to adopt more American names. And this is a video I plan on doing later, kind of just talking about the power of um, assimilating through name and name changes and how that happens over the generations. If you can be awarded this category legally, and then it can be challenged by the government, and then it's re-awarded to you what does that say about the category? It tells me that the category is absolute nonsense. And, and this term white is being used as a stand-in for something else that really doesn't make a lot of sense in reality. Especially when they're talking about this, like the quote, man on the street argument. If someone saw you, would they know right away? You know, I have to wonder, as someone's predominantly European background, what do people think when they see me walking down the street? I don't know what they think, but you know, going phenotype and genotype are totally different things. What if the Cartosians had like spent the week outside before they came to court? They don't get citizenship. Fascinating idea to have to rely on the government to tell you who you are. And this thing we've talked about a little bit on the channel when we kind of talked about blood quantum when we're talking about, um, you know, native nations here in the United States that seen as sovereign by the United States, but at the same time, the United States is 
essentially giving them paperwork to say, hey, you guys are approved for who you are. And, you know, it is a dangerous thing to let the government tell you who you are and define who you are because the government ta- gives and the government takes away. And so I think it's really important for us to start, um, you know, kind of leaning into an alternate way of seeing ourselves and not falling into these government imposed boxes that they want to squeeze you in. And people don't belong in these boxes. It doesn't make any sense. And so I, I hope that this story um, raises some more questions for you as it has for me. So let me know what you think. Did you know this about the Armenians? And uh, what kind of precedent do you think that this has set for us. So let me know what you think and we'll talk soon.